Welcome, everyone, to our annual Songs for Justice. We have a crowded house tonight, and I'm so excited to see all of you. And um, right now, we're going to have our friend Father Gallagher say a quick little prayer over this evening, and then we'll get started. Thank you. When, when uh, Il Presidente asked me to do this, I said, may I? It's a good thing I combed my hair. <laughs> and uh, Christiana, I, I don't do quick or little prayers. No, I think let's, uh, let's be aware of God's presence among us. God as we understand God, God present in our group, and God within us. Be aware of that. And then we thank God for his mercy toward us when we fail in love, and we thank God for all the blessings, particularly Lord, Father, we thank you for our Hispanic ancestors, people that we will hear about in our songs. And may each of us be more motivated to be acting in our own lives for justice. Keep us safe. Keep our undocumented sisters and brothers safe and continue to bless the work of flock and that other fancy name they use. Amen. So before I introduce the band, I just wanted to say thank you for all of you who have donated and supported flock not just now but um over the years uh we couldn't do it without you and we love you and we appreciate you and um <laughs> thank you and um all of you online thank you for showing up and we appreciate you as well um and uh now without further ado agula negra band
de un ranchero enamorado que fue ranchero, ranchero y jugador cuando se llamaba le apodaban charrasqueado era valiente arriesgado el amor a las mujeres más bonitas se llamaba Good Mexican beer drinking song. Uh, I learned it behind a barricade and a picket line at Morgan Packing Company. Uh, that was in uh, 1973, where a group of 120 workers from the Rio Grande Valley, half of them undocumented workers from Mexico, were asked to come and uh, work in a, a, a tomato processing factory in Warren, Indiana, just on the Ohio, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana line. And um, when they got to the uh, to Warren, Indiana, the employer said, "Well, you're going to go out and pick the tomatoes. You're not going to work in the factory. The canning jobs are for the local residents." He said, "But we were recruited to come work in the factory. There were mechanics and line workers and things like that." And uh, so we're not going to work in the fuel. We're going to work in the canning. So no, you're not. Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. And so they uh, they called me up and said we need we have a problem. And um, 
So will you represent us? I said, well, only if you all meet and vote to, to have flock represent you. So, you know, I got in my brother Joe's uh, station wagon. Um, and we didn't have money for motels uh, or anything. So I just put a sleeping bag and took my brother's station wagon, went to Warren, Indiana, had a meeting with the workers and got their story. And I said, well, in the morning, I'll present it to the owner. So I went to sleep in the station wagon. The next morning, I woke up. I heard all this rustling all over the place. And I said, what's going on here? So I rolled down the window and said, hey, what's going on? They were taking old machinery, rusted uh, things that were around the uh, property. And they were building a barricade in front of the main entrance. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're going to do it like we do it in Mexico when we have a, a uh, when we stop work, we take over the factory. And so uh, I said, well, OK. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, by the time the owner showed up at 7 in the morning, we already had this barricade. And there was only one main entrance to the factory uh, because it was a compound with the, with the processing facility and also the, uh, uh, it was uh, the labor camp where the workers were living. And so. Um, the owner shows up, he said, you can't do this. He said, well, we, we do, there's a hundred and some of us and only a handful of you guys. So, classic Mexican standoff. So, <laughs> going back and forth, we knew they were going to uh, get an injunction, but we knew they were gonna make a stake and go to the local court because they knew the judges and everything. So, uh, I called Jack Gallon, our, our, our attorney here in Toledo. Some of you may remember, some of you law students may know the Gallon Law Firm. Uh, Gallon Takis, and uh, I said, Jack, send one of your uh, legal interns over here with a court order to remove this to federal court. Uh, I already knew a little bit about the uh, venue, you know, stuff like that. Not a whole lot, but enough to know that this was a federal case, not a local case. And so we show up for the hearing uh, and handed the, the, the judge the motion to move to federal court. And he was so glad to wash his hands of all this whole thing. Uh, the company uh, had five lawyers there, and they were disappointed that we couldn't do anything. Well, anyway, the standoff lasted 11 days. With the federal court, the judge had to rule against us, and uh, uh, the federal marshal had to come and enforce the order. And to make a long story short, we all got arrested. And uh, <laughs> went, story long. Went, to the, went to federal jail in Fort Wayne, and was there for a day, and um, had the hearing that lasted uh, two days. All this whole time, the factory was closed. The people were still had taken it over. And then uh, we finally had to issue the order. He said, uh, uh, sorry, but we have to issue this order. You can't you know, block ingress and egress to this factory, blah, blah, blah. And I said, but uh, the, the employer, he, he really tongue lashed the employer for the treatment of the workers. The reaction to the public was so great that um, uh, the Civil Rights Commission in Indiana had subpoena powers, and they started doing all kinds of actions against the company, and the company had to succumb and give us everything we were asked for in our demands. So, so we won that strike in a roundabout way. And, um, but every night, we're sitting behind that barricade, the only thing we had to do was entertain ourselves, and so the people brought out their accordions and guitars, and, and I knew that song, my mom sang bits and parts of that song while we were working in the fields. Because mom would sing to us in the fields when the days got long, we'd get tired of picking, and the mom would start singing to lift our spirits. And she sang parts of the song. and never knew all the lyrics until behind the barricade one night, there's a lady who sang the entire song and said, you got to teach it to me. And that's where I learned that song. So. so this brings to mind this next song. Um, and, um, 1948, February 28, 1948, a plane took off um, in Fresno, California. I think it was Fresno. And uh, that was the days of the old Baracero program. Uh, the workers' uh, contract ran out, and they were uh, taking these um, uh, workers to the deportation center. And so, as the story goes, uh, told by my friend, uh, another folk singer named J John McCutcheon, uh, the, uh, the plane took off. 
uh, and uh, developed the, one of the engines developed a problem and it crashed in uh, Los Gatos Canyon. And uh, the next day on the 29th of February 1948, uh, it appeared in the New York Times. And uh, the, as uh, my friend John explains it, that of the thousands of people that read that article, it named the, uh, the three crew members, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the attendant, their names, their age, where they were from, about their background, and also 28 Mexicans being deported. Nobody knew their names uh, until the, I think, like 50th or 60th anniversary. Uh, John was uh, playing in a gig in Fresno and realized that, um, they said, what happened to these workers? They were buried in a cemetery uh, near Fresno. Uh, and um, he went early to see if he could find the burial, where the, the, these workers are buried, they were buried in a mass grave. And one stone uh, that just said 28 Mexicans from Mexico uh, workers. And um, so he and some friends uh, did a campaign to find out who these workers, they were, they were, they had visas in that Bracero program, so there must be a record of who they were. They discovered all their names and uh, money was raised by supporters all over the country and built a monument that, for the first time, wrote all the names of those workers on that stone. And we're given a proper uh, funeral with their names recognized. And as John explained it, it's not a story about some heroism, some people doing this nice act of this deed. It's about uh, a guy like Woody Guthrie who wrote the song after reading it in the New York Times as supposedly the, one of the most famous songs he ever wrote. And he wrote this song uh, about the uh, plane wreck of Los Gatos. In Los Gatos. And uh, for all these years, that song kept the memory of those men alive until somebody found out who they were and gave them the, uh, the appropriate names and burial of these, uh, these men. The song is known as Deportees. Crops are all in, beaches are rotten. They're flying back to that Mexican border. Spin all the money to come back again. My father's own father, he waited that river. He made in his life. Brothers and sisters come work in the fruit tree. They rode in the trucks till they took down and died. Goodbye, my one. Goodbye, Rosalina. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria.
Guthrie wrote that song, I wrote this next song. The theme is the same. Uh, Urbano Ramirez was a worker who uh, had symptoms of heat exhaustion, asked for help. The supervisors told him to go sit under the tree. And um, um, When they finished the work day, they bust the workers back to the labor camp and didn't bother to look for Urbano Ramirez. Five, six days later, his, uh, his co-workers went back to the last place they had seen him. And um, uh, they found his uh, body already decomposed beyond recognition. Uh, the body lay in a morgue for some days. Uh, we took up the cause of Urbano, filed his workers' comp case. It took us three years to win it because they appealed it to every level, saying that he was undocumented and therefore shouldn't have any right to anything, like he's not a person. Uh, we won the case. And uh, Bob Willis, the attorney, and I, we uh, took part of the award to the widow and in uh, Guerrero, Mexico, and um, he had five children, so the woman got a, a pretty huge award, and we had to put most of it in a fund in Mexico City to transfer the amount that she needed every month because the people that smuggled her husband would have been all over her, you know, steal the money from her. So we created a, a program to protect her uh, and her children. And, uh, and a certain amount of the money was put aside for, uh, for the kids' education that they would draw from because in Mexico, you gotta pay for uh, secondary education uh, for high school and uh, only grammar school is free. Uh, and so, um, over and over again. It doesn't end. 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. This happened in 2002. And it just goes on and on and on. These tragedies happen. 
uh, because we don't have immigration reform, we don't have a way to govern people, the flow of people in regions where we have economic relationships. And um, uh, but Urbano was one of the victims of this system, and this is why Flock fights. And not only these horrendous abuses, but um, many other things, wage theft, uh, all kinds of uh, things, and it just uh, continues. So we do our best to do it, but we try to memorize these things so these these men are not forgotten the way those uh, the men that Woody Guthrie wrote about. That we keep them alive in order to do things, to act on them, and encourage our people to stand up for themselves, which is what we do. But we write these songs to remember men like Urbano.
switching little gears a little bit, we sort of, in the life experience of migrant workers, uh, we do things to cope with these things. But a lot of times you don't know where you're going, what, what life is going to bring in front of you. You don't, you don't know the future. You don't know what's in front of you. But you know there's going to be problems. You're going to run into all kinds of people. And uh, in the 60s, when I started singing Mexican music at these folk meetings, gatherings, uh, festivals, and so on, um, I got to hearing the songs of the contemporary folk singers at that time. And uh, this song really resonated with me because it's about traveling around. They used to have these, uh, you know, these uh, traveling songs that these folk singers used to do. And uh, about the people that you meet. Um, <laughs> So this, uh, this song spoke to me a lot in terms of the way we, we see things because you're leaving your family and you're going to a new place. You don't know what kind of people you're going to meet. But um, uh, anyways, uh, listen to this song. Um, Tom Paxson. Can't help but wonder where I'm bound. Part about being a migrant worker is leaving your home, Leave, leaving leaving your family, leaving your loved ones, being separated uh, uh, from them for a long period of time. And I think that uh, uh, 
that traveling far away from your home and leaving uh, those behind you that you love the most. Uh, I want to relate this to migrant workers, not only here in the U.S., but all the way to Canada. We have a regional problem here. It's not just U.S., Mexico. It's all the way from Central America, all the way up to Canada. And um, so this song is about Canadian micro workers. Uh, you know, oddly enough, it was written in the 19, late 50s, early 60s. And uh, I don't know, Elizabeth, would you come up and help me with this? So, I, I don't know if we can uh, have Canada. Yeah. Give me some uh, background music on this. Stay up uh, on this next song because we have a, 
uh, another song that resonated with me is the uh, uh, traveling in these trucks from South Texas to Ohio when we were first migrating here and my family from the Rio Grande Valley. And um, this was the early 1950s. And in those days, um, you know, there weren't any four lane highways. And so there was um, our mode of transportation were these flatbed trucks with wooden sideboards and a canvas thrown over the top. And five or six families crammed in the back. And uh, uh, that was our way of uh, transportation. So our whole family was in the back. I remember as a little kid, Coming up to my mom, trying to keep warm in those uh, coldest in uh, North Texas, but the humming of the wheels of the truck. I mean, they didn't have windows; only the skylight of the triangle where the canvas was over the back of the truck, and um, there were no um, public. Uh, well, the public restrooms were black and white. It's the days of segregation, so the 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 deep the deep south route was the worst. There were two routes up uh, through Panhandle in Texas to Route 66 and cut across, or uh, Little Rock, Texarkana, Little Rock, up through Memphis, uh, through the Deep South. That was the worst. But you see all these signs, no Mexicans, dogs, or the N-word allowed, and that's all you saw. And us Mexicans didn't know which drinking fountains, which bathrooms to use, so we didn't want to get in trouble with anybody, so we just... We knew when the, when the truck pulled over to a gravel, we could hear the wheels, the gravel. We knew it was a pit stop. There was a woods there, and the crawl out of the back. Mike, you probably remember that. Mike Riesel sitting out there. Uh, the women would go one direction, they may go in the other direction. That was our pit stop. And uh, water, we had to go to a public park and fill jugs up and, and keep them in the, in, the, in the truck, and that's the way we made our way to, to Ohio. And it was... Uh, but I remember, you know, the, uh, the storms and the weather and the humming of the wheels was kind of like our lullaby because there was nothing. You just sat there with nothing to do. And um, uh, you were either cold or hot uh, or bored to death. Uh, but that's, that, was, uh, that was the way we survived in those days. The main thing was always looking a way to get home. Someday getting back uh, home. And uh, so this song really resonated with me when I heard uh, John Denver sing it. And uh, uh, I thought that um, uh, uh, if you listen to the lyrics, it just, I could just remember those experiences in the back of that truck and um, hearing the humming of the wheels. And uh, it, it seemed like the days just droned on and on and on. Tell the baby moon just yesterday. 
start to transition into the fight songs. I uh, want to make sure we recognize uh, some very important people that showed up. Uh, the former mayor, Paula Hicks, was here a little while ago. She had to go to her graduation uh, to her daughter in Bowling Green, so we thank her for, for coming. And of course, we got our great friend, Cardi Finkbeiner, former mayor of Toledo. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we have um, we have a judge in the audience, uh, Judge uh, uh, Blousey over here. He's sitting right over here. So if you get in trouble, call the judge. <laughs> and then we have uh, City Councilwoman Katie Moline. Thank you, Katie. Boy, that girl is smart. Okay. Uh, and uh, last of all, we have. Uh, our friend, uh, our uh, city auditor, uh, there we go, uh, Anita Lopez is here. And, then, and um, she's, running, she's running for county commissioner, so we'd like to have the first Latino person as a county commissioner one of these days. So we hope that'll be, that'll be her, so. Uh, so anyways, uh, what we would like to do is, um, uh, I like to do this song uh, because you know the marginalization of people uh, is just historic in this country. When you talk about it. not just Latinos, particularly during slavery, post uh, America, post slavery America, uh, indentured servitude, uh, what do you call it, uh, sharecropping, tenant farming. Uh, all those uh, economic designs were designed to keep poor people in the land uh, working for cheap. And um, uh, I want to do this next song because it was written by a, a sharecropping woman, a uh, black woman in uh, Mississippi Delta. And um, uh, became very popular in the 60s with folk singers. 
but when I researched a little bit of the song, tried to find out where it came from, and uh, it was written by this uh, woman named Elizabeth Cotton. Uh, of course, we first heard it with uh, some of the 60s folk singing groups like Peter, Paul, and Mary and other groups. They all recorded this song. But the song had made its way from the Deep South all the way to Europe, and some European singers really tried to steal the song. And, uh, but when, uh, when it hit back to the United States, they, uh, they were called on it, and uh, uh, finally credit was given to this black woman who wrote this song. And uh, what was unusual about Elizabeth Cotton, that she had a very interesting picking style on the guitar. It was a two-finger picking. Uh, <laughs> Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She called it cotton picking. Um, the the name for this kind of picking was evolved into uh, what folk singers later called Travis picking, uh, which we did with three fingers. That's that's where I learned it. And um, but the song is kind of like a sad song because in those days it was kind of like saying life is really terrible and then you die. <laughs> so. And so all you got to look forward to is how am I going to be buried? And uh, how, what is going to be my grave? And so on. So Elizabeth Cotton wrote this song, and it's, um, uh, it's just a testimony of the of people like her who suffered uh, those days of marginalization, those economic designs uh, that we learned all too well, people in poverty, and we're still seeing the legacy of that oppression as we try to uh, make our way in American life. Whether you're black, Latino, uh, indigenous people in this country, there's a lot of marginalized people, but we wrote the songs to give us some kind of uh, meaning in life. So, and I don't know how she did it because she was picking this guitar. It was, uh, it was a guitar like this for a right-handed uh, guitar player, but she was left-handed. So she would turn it upside down and, and pick it upside down. And how she got those sangha, I have no clue. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, I try to do it some justice. So it goes something like this. Thank you. 
Okay, how about white people? Uh, I thought that for you too. <laughs> the white people, you know, uh, back in the during the Deep Depression, of course, there were a lot of poor white people. Man, I tell you, they went through all kinds of crazy stuff. But in those days, we don't have the support programs that we have now. There are no food stamp programs, no welfare during the Deep Depression. And uh, this song, um, and, you know, here in Toledo, they still got the old newsboys. You know, they're, um, uh, you see them out uh, around this time of the year with their, you know, collecting uh, things. And 100% of that uh, goes out. They don't have any overhead. They don't have a director or anything. So if you see them on the street, give them a little donation. So this song is about a newsboy uh, who appears that he was a, a son of a single mom. And he made his living by hawking newspapers. Uh, Jimmy Brown, the newsboy. And uh, what speaks loudly in this song is that he may be poor and ragged, but he was proud that he had a job. He was proud that he was out there making a living. And um, I picked the song up from uh, recorded by uh, actually uh, Earl Scruggs, the famous banjo picker, but he was playing guitar on this song. So uh, uh, a lot of people had to copy that style. I think you can still see it on YouTube. Um, it must have been recorded back in the 40s. Uh, early 50s at least. Uh, it's called Jimmy Brown, the Newsboy. Um, Last set of songs are the fight songs. Uh, it's time that we get up and uh, start uh, getting moving on defending the people, but we have to get ourselves um, ready. We have to be emotionally, spiritually ready uh, to take on whatever comes in front of us. Now, all of us have to have a safety net. We all have to have a personal way of coping with the challenges, sometimes impossible challenges that are in front of us. And so uh, 
we uh, rely on spiritual help, Father Gallagher, it's probably the most important because if you don't have the spirit, man, you don't got nothing. And it's it, the intellect is going to only take you so far. With due respect with all the religions of the world and our Judeo-Christian uh, 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 way of looking at things, um, we look on the great helper to help us uh, from one day to the next. And so, uh, this song uh, gets us ready for the fight because whatever you face, uh, you have to have the the emotional and spiritual stamina to stand up to whatever opposition is there. Um, are you going to help me with this, Elizabeth? Now, the song we wrote about the fight, we fight back. We're ready, we're ready, uh, we got ourselves together, got our heads together, got our spirit up, and uh, okay, this next song is a song that um, we wrote during the Campbell Soup fight. Uh, I know some of you may remember the march from Toledo to Camden, New Jersey, 600 miles in 36 days in July and, uh, July and August, the hottest days of the summer. We marched over the high-level bridge from South Toledo 
We had a rally in front of St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church. <coughs> Walked to, uh, the high level bridge all the way to Route 2. Went into Lorraine, Cleveland, Youngstown, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, uh, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, and over the Ben Franklin Bridge in the Camden, New Jersey, the world headquarters of Campbell Soup. And uh, at that time, um, uh, every night we had a rally. People would come out of the woodwork to help us. And um, uh, we had $500 and 100 of us started marching. I remember my wife, Sarah, who's here. She, we were out near Bono uh, on Route 2 the first day. And she looked, she was marching up in front with me. And she says, is this absolutely necessary? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that, and uh, and uh, but we that was just the first day, <laughs> and uh, by golly, we made it. Uh, we started with 500. By the time we get back, all the people that donated money, we came we came back with about twenty thousand dollars in the treasury, which we used to support the the strike. But every night along the way, we had a rally, and uh, my son Aaron, who's sitting over there. He, learned, he took his first steps in Lorraine, Ohio, at the uh, Sacred Heart Chapel there where they hosted us for dinner and everything like that. He's sitting right over there. And um, of course, now he's a, a big shot engineer. So <laughs> he was the engineer that I wanted to be, but I switched my major after uh, seeing the way they treated my grandparents in South Texas. But anyway, it's another story. Uh, this song, we had a rally every night, but all our songs were in Spanish, all these Mexican songs. So we said, we had to write a song for the English-speaking people. And who most needs to hear about our, our cause than the rednecks? So we turned on the country and western music stations and got this song from Ricky Skaggs. And we did what Pete Seeger taught me. You make a zipper song out of it. You use the tune, but you zip out a verse, and you zip on it in a new verse. So <laughs> this song is called Crying My Heart Out Over You. And Ricky Stead. Kags, you know, you can still see it on YouTube. Uh, it's about a guy that, I don't know, didn't treat his wife or his girlfriend all that good, and she ended up leaving him. And, uh, and then he, um, he realized what he lost. So he's, the song is about him crying his heart out over her that left, her, that left him. And, and so um, uh, that's what it is. So we took the song and said, this is a farmer whose workers have left him to go on strike that they had the strike and therefore he's missing them. So he's crying his heart out over the farm workers that left him to go on strike. This became the number one hit song in the strike. So <laughs> see how were we doing this? Uh, uh, all right. Uh, I want to introduce the uh, Johnny on the accordion. Orlando on the bass, and you saw Elizabeth, my daughter, uh, accompany him on some of those songs, and, um, and this young lady here is Selena. Selena. You've heard of Selena, haven't you? You've heard of Selena, right? And so, anyways, uh, 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 she plays the classical violin, so we snookered in to say, can you... Can you Billy Billy ice that up a little bit? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so um, she's gonna do her best on this song because it does have a what we call a fiddle, but she calls it a violin. So, okay, here we go. Take it away. Since you went away, my prophet 
fight song that we wrote uh, was um, uh, about the Mount Olive fight, uh, the campaign that uh, essentially was won because of people here in Toledo. The only place in the country that got Kroger's, the regional Kroger's network throughout Northwest Ohio, Myers, Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan, and at that time Food Town to remove Mount Olive pickles from their shelves. And, and due to large part to the support of some of you in this room, uh, especially Mayor Finkbeiner, uh, the CEO of Mount Olive came to Toledo to put uh, a, a stop on the support that we had here. And he actually called a meeting with the mayor. And the mayor called me up and said, you better have some people down here on the 22nd floor. So we, we surrounded him with all these labor leaders and everything. And, the, and then uh, the guy from the Mount Olive came in there. He started to um, um, uh, jawbone the mayor. And uh, I remember Carney interrupted you, and then and I said, that's not going to go well with this guy. <laughs> and Carney, in true fashion, just shut him down. I mean, I'm telling you, I've never, see, I never, I never seen a CEO of any company being so tongue-lashed by the way Carney uh, did it with him that day. The guy went out of there, man, kind of uh, a, a lost cause at Toledo. They wrote it up. But you know, they were trying to make Mount Olive a national brand. And they test market everything in the Midwest. So they came right into our backyard. And so we were able to make the boycott really effective here and uh, put a stop to it. And it wasn't until the Myers uh, management in Grand Rapids called me up. We're going to do a march to Grand Rapids. They said, before you do that, let us come and talk to you. So, um, so they came to Toledo. And uh, they, uh, they said, well, give us a week. Let, let us talk to the Mount Olive. Within a week, I got a call from the CEO of Mount Olive, the same guy that, <laughs> that Cardi ran out of Toledo. Um, and uh, he said, when's the next time you're going to be down here? I said, well, at the end of the month. He said, well, meet us at the North Carolina Grower Association. I said, who is it? He did not want to. He wanted to settle the boycott, but he didn't want to create a separate association of his uh, suppliers, of his growers, 
to facilitate a collective bargaining agreement because most of his growers were already members of this bigger uh, North Carolina Grower Association. So we not only got 80 some uh, cucumber growers, we got over 500 growers in that whole North Carolina Grower Association to sign that collective bargaining agreement. So, um, uh, and part of that was uh, writing the song, part of the campaign we're doing, the song that we wrote called Better Than Nada. Is that we took a song from the Texas Tornadoes, again, another zipper song, we just rewrote the, the lyrics. And uh, um, uh, there's uh, stories that these verses tell. Now, one is uh, the first time we were trying to uh, rent a hall, because we're having our meetings in the living room in this old house, and it was getting too small for the number of the workers that were coming. So we went to Newton Grove, North Carolina. There was a, a Legion, American Legion Hall there, and uh, we wanted to rent it. So I called this lady up and I said, uh, ma'am, uh, we'd like to rent your hall. She said, who are you? I said, I'm bothering my Velasquez. And she said, what's that? I said, that's Mexican. And then she said, oh, we don't rent to Mexicans. And so, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I've told this story before. Um, I started laughing and she said, what's so funny? They said, well, you have to rent to us because uh, we're affiliated to the North Carolina AFL-CIO and the, the National AFL-CIO, and I'm sure I can get some better and to come down here and rent it for us. She said, who'd you say you were? I said, Valdemar Velasquez, uh, president of FLOC, Farm Labor Organization Committee, AFL-CIO. And uh, he said, well, uh, you don't sound Mexican. I said, well, what do I sound like? <laughs> she said, no, really, she said, you sound educated. <laughs> and uh, and so we let it go, and then but she quoted me a price that was twice the amount, and I said, well, you know what, we're gonna pay it. We're not gonna let that money keep us from uh, making our meeting and having our say. That was one of the verses in the song. The other one was uh, uh, the Diablo, a grower who had the reputation of being the devil among the workers. There's stories galore all over the area, and. Uh, Nobody wanted to work for him once they worked for him once. And um, um, we were out signing uh, workers up, our authoriz union authorization cards. And uh, I was out one night and I was having a, t we were having a tough time. We only had one worker sign a, a card the whole, the whole first week I was there. And I recruited him to ride shotgun with me, go to the camps. Uh, his name was Mario. And so uh, one night we were coming back from, uh, again, another, we met a lot of workers, knocked on the door, and you know they were very gracious, accepted us. And but as soon as I tell them we're from the union, signing union cards, they start looking down the road to see who's watching us. Uh, obviously, an air of intimidation. And so uh, I was taking him uh, back to his house trailer uh, one night, and uh, I said, "Let's stop at that uh, get, that uh, convenience store to get a, a, a coke to drink on the way home." And we started uh, pulling up there, and he said, no, don't stop there. That's the, that's the truck of El Diablo. It's the truck of the devil. And uh, uh, sure enough, there's a big, tall guy, about 6'4", you know, blonde hair, blue-eyed guy, was talking at the door with a, to a couple. And uh, he said, that's, 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 that's El Diablo. That's the devil there. And um, I said, well, this is the guy I want to meet. So I pulled up behind him, and, um, and Mario was sinking down, put his head down, <laughs> looking over the uh, front of the counter of the, of the car and I go out and they, I go up to this guy and I said uh, uh, are you Mr. Smith he said, yeah I said I'm Bobby McRoskin president of flock and I'm the guy signing a card for the union and all these farms here and it would behoove you to tell me where the Manalo farms because they're our target we're not after the other uh, processors that grow cucumbers here he, he says uh, well um, he says, uh, who do you say you were? I said, I'm Bobby Mann, president of the flock, and I repeated it, and I said, look, it would behoove you to support us because you know what we're getting for number one cucumbers in Ohio with the union contract over there for the growers? We're getting, uh, uh, we're getting uh, $24 per hundredweight of number ones, and I bet you're not getting more than $18 for those. He said, well, 24 does sound better. And uh, uh, I said, that's what we're doing because we, we need to preserve your prices so you can pay us. We know that uh, you don't have a, uh, deep pockets that uh, like the manufacturer that you sell your cucumbers to. And he said, well, the Monalo farms aren't, aren't on this road. They're, they're, they're on the roads over there. And he told me where they were. So uh, I said, well, thank you very much. You know, we'll be in touch. And here's my card. We can you hear any rumors about us. He 
call me and you hear it from directly from the horse's mouth. And so um, I get back into the car and Mario says, um, what, uh, uh, what did he say? He says, um, well, I don't know, but we're going to go see those farms over here. He said, no, but there's a lot of farms right here on this road. I said, no, these are not Manala farms. They're over there. He said, well, how did you know that? Well, the devil told me. And so, <laughs> so uh, that's the, uh, uh, but that same grower came out in the news that he had treated his workers so badly that they left in the middle of the night to and seek refuge in an evangelical Mexican church. Uh, in uh, uh, Pink Hill, North Carolina. And um, the next day, the pastor came out denouncing the farmer for the bad treatment of those workers. And um, uh, so that's the, uh, uh, the story about that verse. Um, ten years later, that farmer was part of the Grower Association and is under a union contract. So nothing is impossible. <laughs> Uh, the song is Better Than Nada. This song, uh, not to forget, uh, for us not to 
be callous and not allow ourselves to be indifferent to these things. It's, it's very easy to be indifferent, out of sight, out of mind. And um, a fellow named Leon Gecko wrote this song. It's gone all over the world because it definitely resonates with uh, reminding people, particularly those who were raised that weren't so fortunate and were able to make it in life. It's easy to forget those behind you. Um, so this song speaks to not forgetting and not be callous.
all very much. Thank you for coming. I saw Erica White come in later on in the program. Thank you, Erica, for being here. Thank you, Carney. Keith Burroughs came in from Pittsburgh, somewhere out there in the boondocks. Thank you for coming. Uh, Mike Riso, Father Gallagher, all of those. Uh, uh, Melinda uh, Sanchez, gracias a todos for, for attending and appreciate your support. And adelante, together we're going to win more victories. Right. Adios. Hey. Would you guys help me out with something? Would you all help me out with something? Um, you know, those of us involved in the movement, you know, a lot of times we, we don't have a, this family events and we have uh, times when you know I know I've missed some of my son's ball games and my daughter's cheerleading and things like that and uh, sometimes we miss their events and last night I missed uh, my granddaughter's uh, birthday uh, last night uh, birthday dinner up in Michigan so I know that all of us who are involved in politics the movement we miss important events for our loved ones and so I'm sure that other, other people have had birthdays here. So let's do a round of happy birthday for my granddaughter uh, that's right over Thank here, uh, Raquel. Raquel. And I'm sure there's others uh, who uh, birthdays have happened. So let's give us. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Buenas noches. Good night.